Beautiful. Good. All right, guys, welcome back. I hope everybody made some good connections and made some new friends. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into our guest speaker here. So with us tonight, we have our friend, Mr. Joseph James. He is the founder and CEO of RO Muse Solutions. Joseph, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. We're excited to have you here. And so a little bit about Joseph. He is the director of sales and leasing um, for the 2020 commercial group. He's a real estate investor and developer, a commercial real estate broker and commercial real estate coach and mentor. So again, Joseph, thank you so much for being here, man. We're really excited to learn about, you know, your platform and your educational services. And uh, we'll let you take it from here, man. Tell us a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Joseph James. I'll, I'll cover a little bit more about me when we start doing the presentation about some of my background and things like that. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a commercial broker, like Cody said. Uh, I have a team in Dallas. Uh, we primarily focus on office, retail, industrial kind of properties. But my background has been in, in multifamily. You know, I've been involved with a lot of multifamily syndication groups and uh, I'm also a passive investor in, in, uh, in a few multifamily properties as well. Uh, looking to get into doing some syndication sometime down the road, not my priority right now because I'm basically really busy running two companies, which is the commercial brokerage and my software company. So uh, if there's good opportunities, I might be one of your passive investors, but uh, if I get a good opportunity, I'll bring it to you as well. So, so let's go with that. Awesome. All right, so you want me to go ahead and share my screen and uh, go through the presentation, Cody? Or I will do that. Looks like he's on mute. All right. <laughs> so what I prepared today was basically a basic uh, underwriting class. Uh, I think it looks like all of you already know this, so this might be just be a refresher because this class I uh, this is one of my the first classes I teach folks uh, investment analysis 101. So uh, uh, you know I'm I'm guessing based on the conversation I just had. Most of you are already familiar with this. Okay, that's the wrong one. This is the right one. All right, so we'll, we'll get in, get going here. And uh, please feel free to stop me and ask questions. Uh, one, this is a small group, so we can definitely stop and you know discuss anything you know, that you have in mind. So uh, let me get started here. So welcome. Thanks for thanks for having me here. And uh, so what we do different from a lot of other companies is uh, we do a lot of training for brokers and investors and you know people who want to get into the business, but we always come from an angle of how do you grow your wealth and how do you increase your income, right? So it's, we are different from your traditional sources of, uh, especially when you, do, when you, you know, in the commercial brokerage world, there are a lot of training out there, but those are more like a university kind of trainings where you take a class, you know, it's kind of, if you, if any, you know, if you, if you all remember the last time you took a finance class in a, in a college or, you know, masters, right? So that is most of the content out there. So we definitely are more aligned with the multifamily groups and the syndicator groups and people who are trying to uh, do deals, right? So let me go through uh, the investment analysis framework and uh, a little bit more myself, uh, Joseph James, uh, just got my CCIM designation uh, not too long ago. Uh, so if you're not sure what CCIM is, you can look look it up, ccim.com. It's a designation for uh, commercial brokers who meet certain standards, right? And it, it's a long, it's a pretty long process to take a bunch of classes, you know, uh, and then eventually what you do is you end up with something called a CCIM pen. Uh, the exam is about six hours long, uh, mostly in a math and financial type of questions. But anyway, so that is something a uh, lot of brokers uh, strive for. Uh, I'm a real estate investor, uh, also a developer. Uh, we do a commercial brokerage team based in Dallas and, uh, and also uh, do some real estate coaching. I'm not a big guru or big coach like that. I coach people one-on-one -on -one and you know, I'm actually doing a, starting a coaching program on the 15th, which is for commercial brokers. So it's not for you guys, sorry, but you know, we might do something like that in the future for investors, but I'm doing one for commercial brokers. I think I've probably are close to 100 people registered for that. It's going to be a 12 week program. So just to give you, you know, an idea about some of the things that I'm working on. All right, so let's get into the investment analysis framework. Uh, we'll talk about performance, some of the metrics that, um, you know, that you should be looking at. Uh, we'll talk about how to increase value and also uh, look at, you know, uh, sensitivity, and sensitivity analysis, right? Or creating how to create what if scenarios 
and whatnot uh, when you're looking at underwriting a property, you know, because we are making a lot of assumptions when you underwrite a property, right? It's basically business forecasting, what we do when we say underwriting. So a lot of the times what we forecast is not going to come true, right? So, uh, so it's your fiduciary responsibility to look at it from different angles you know, so that you're uh, covering all the bases for your investors because your, your job, you know, as underwriters or syndicators are to primarily to protect the money of your investors. All right, and then we'll talk about how to calculate maximum offer based on your target yield and also based on you know, cap rates and a few other measures as well. And then if time, if there's time, um, again, you know, uh, Cody or Abel, you know, just stop me whenever you want if you're running out of time. But uh, I also put in a few charts on how to split profits because a lot of syndicators want to know when you're starting out, hey, how does this work now? How do I get paid, right? And you know, so I have, um, I just threw in a couple of charts in there as well. You know, hopefully that will benefit everybody. All right, so let's talk about investment analysis framework. So, so here's the framework, right? I call it a framework because that's what it is, right? So you start with potential rental income and that is the most important number that you have to get and most people get it wrong. So I see a lot of underwriting done and most people will take uh, the current PNL or let's say, you know, trailing six months or trailing, you know, 12 months or whatever it is they have access to and then they extrapolate the data and they get this number wrong. Right, so this is the big mistake you can do. Uh, so make sure that you understand what potential rental income is. Uh, so the keyword here is potential, right? So the definition is, uh, it is the highest a property can produce if it's 100% occupied and rented at, uh, at least at market rates, right? So, so, the, <clears throat> so you have to do some market rent surveys and look, some, look at some analytics to find out hey, if this property uh, you know, or similar properties, you know, if it's 100% occupied and leased at market rates, you know, how much can I get for rents by unit type? Uh, so that will, you know, that will help you identify if there's opportunity to improve value, right? That's the whole idea about what we do here is to create value. And you have to, I can't stress enough that you have to understand what potential rental income means and how to get to that. So um, that is usually done with market surveys and market analysis. And there is no, uh, no other way to get that. You're not going to get that from the seller. All right, so then what you do is you take away the losses, right? And there are several kinds of losses. There is loss to vacancy, turnover. There's loss to lease, meaning that you're leasing below market. You know, there's loss to collections. There's loss to bad debt. You know, there's loss to, you know, probably, you know, 10 other ways you can lose money at a property, right? So you have to look at all the different losses that can happen and underwrite that. So a lot of the time, again, I'll point out some of the mistakes we see. So hopefully that will help you guys. So a lot of the time we'll see people underwriting uh, deals. They'll say, oh, the market vacancies uh, or market occupancies, uh, you know, 97%. So I'm going to underwrite a deal with 3% loss because that's a huge mistake, right? There are so many other, other ways, you know, that you're losing money at the property uh, and you really have to factor in all the other kind of losses that, that can happen to the property. Uh, then you add in other income. So I'm showing you the minus and plus here so you can follow along. So other income would be anything like your laundry, park, covered parking, vending machines, you know, business centers, you know, dog parks, whatever you can charge uh, to get extra income. You know, some people put in, you know, storage units, uh, storage units, you know, typically there's an argument that, okay, that's a rental income because that's really a rent. Uh, but some people will put that into uh, other income bucket as well. So storage units, uh, billboard, billboard, cell towers, people get creative about how they can generate income at a property, especially if it's close to highways and things like that. Then what you do is you add in expense recovery. Um, in cases of commercial properties, uh, most of the commercial properties are gravitating towards the triple net kind of lease structure. So a lot of the operating expenses are passed through to the tenants. Uh, in case of multifamily, uh, when we're talking about expense recovery, it's usually your, your rubs, right? Your ratio utility billing that, that you are, maybe billing some portion or all of uh, some utilities, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, water, sewer, garbage, et cetera, back to the tenants. So if you can get that, then that becomes an income, right? So that's an, you know, that's a plus, right? You're adding, adding to your, um, and we'll see where we're going with this. Then the big bucket is operating expenses. So the operating expenses, the big one is always going to be taxes. And when you're underwriting properties, make sure that uh, you want to plan for the taxes going up after like after you buy the property. So let's say you're looking at a $10 million property and the, the seller is currently paying taxes based on 10 million and 
uh, all, all of us say they're basic, basically paying taxes on 7 million, plan on that property tax, property value being increased by the county to 10 million, right? So you had to kind of, you know, plan for paying the taxes. A lot of, sometimes people do like an 80% or 90% rule, but some people do it 100% just to be safe. But I think most these days, most people are doing like 90% is what I'm, 90% of the purchase price times the tax rate, right? So those that's how you can, you know, when you underwrite, you can use something like that. But again, talk to other people in the market who are more experts in that area. So that's how you get to the net operating income, right? So net operating income is your holy grail, right? That's how the value is determined for a, you know, investment property is by looking at net operating income and looking at what is the prevailing market cap. So again, to go through the, uh, the framework, potential rental income minus losses plus other income plus expense recovery minus operating expenses gives you the net operating income, right? And going back to the operating expenses, that's a big bucket, right? That's a catch-all bucket. So they have, the big expenses are going to be property taxes in property insurance. Then you have your salaries, your maintenance, repairs, you know, your utilities, contract services, you know, there's, you know, a bunch of stuff that goes into uh, marketing, advertising, asset management, everything goes into operating expenses. All right, so there are a couple things below the net operating income or we call it below NOI. So one is capital expenses, right? So if you have capital expenses that are uh, like, you know, roof, you know, roof replacement or parking lot repairs or even HVAC, things like that, that have a useful life of more than a year, Typically, your accountant CPA will tell you to capitalize it. So those expenses are not included in the NOI. So if you look at NOI, and if you only look at NOI, you know you may not make any money, right? Because the capital expenses might be high at the property, especially an older property. You have to factor in your capital expenses as well, right? So make sure that you can, you know, forecast a cash flow. Now, leasing commissions typically don't apply to multifamily, uh, but in office, retail, industrial, commercial properties, leasing commissions are huge, right? Because, you know, somebody might be you know, signing a 10 year, 20 year leases, and those commissions can be, you know, $100,000 or $200,000. Those are typically amortized costs. So that is below NOI as well. And <clears throat> then this is another big item, annual debt service, which is the mortgage payment, right? So that is also below NOI. So the NOI does not include uh, your mortgage, right? It's uh, NOI cap rate, all of that is all, uh, you know, does not factor in any leverage on the property, right? So that is, um, you, know, you know, that is the way you underwrite commercial properties and then you get your net cash flow. So once you have your net operating income, you know, minus your capital expenses, minus your mortgage payments, you get to net, net cash flow. Uh, sometimes people, you know, who are very new in the business, which I'm sure you guys are not, um, will confuse net operating income with net cash flow. You know, big mistake, right? So make sure you understand the difference. I mean, you know, the difference is net operating income does not include capital expenses and mortgage, right? That's a, just remember that much. So that is a full framework for analyzing a commercial property. So when you're underwriting a property, you're trying to project what is going to be your first year. Uh, what is this framework going to look like in year one? That's ex exactly what you're trying to do. So you're going to use the data from historic data, the actuals or T12, and you're going to look at you know, industry benchmarks or rule of thumbs. And then based on your experience, you're going to come up with a, a financial projection of what these numbers are going to look like for year one. So once you get this part right, then the rest of the years, you know, year two to year five is basically your business plan. You know, how do you plan to reduce the losses <laughs> or how do you plan to increase the rents or those are kind of things that comes after establishing the year one numbers, right? So we'll talk about that as well. So this is, the framework. So it's very easy framework. Uh, once you understand it, you know, it makes your life a lot easier for underwriting properties. All right. Any questions before we move on? All right. Looks like everybody's good. So let's talk about investment performance measurements. So I have uh, the framework that we just talked about here front and center. So let's talk about net operating income. So uh, net operating income is right here and cap rate and value, right? So we all know how to calculate value in commercial real estate for income producing property. There are multiple ways you can appraise a property, but most commonly it's called in income capitalization approach. And you can also do a sales comp approach and you know, a replacement cost approach and there are multiple, but let's just stick to income capitalization approach. That's what all of us are going to be using for multifamily uh, va valuations, right? So the value you know, of a, you know, a property is NOI divided by cap rate. 
right? So uh, where do you, the question then becomes, okay, I know exact, I know how to calculate NOI, where do you get the cap rate from, right? And what does cap rate mean? Well, cap rate is going to be, you know, that's, we call it prevailing cap rate because it's what the market is willing to pay, right? Is what other investors are willing to pay for a similar property. And it's going to vary. Uh, in case of multifamily, the cap rate, you know, will you know, be different in the, based on location, based on asset class, you know, based on a few other things, right? So it's all, you know, come down to you kind of generalizing it, but sometimes a property, people might be willing, willing to buy a property at a lower cap rate because they see a potential, right? Or to raise value of the property. So there is, so cap rate is just a benchmark, you know, uh, everybody understands cap rate. So, but again, cap rate is also a point in time, right? It's only, you know, we call it acquisition cap rate or going in cap rate. So just make sure that cap rate is just one thing to look at. It's not going to tell you the whole story. It's just going to tell you yeah, how much could be a potential value of the property based on the NOI. And we are calculating the value based on, so this is another thing I want to clarify. So you're not calculating the value of the property based on the T12 NOI, even though that is a recommended way to do it so that you're not overpaying for the property. But the most people will underwrite the property saying, what is my year one NOI? So you're paying for how much NOI you can get, you know, for year one, right? Year one, meaning that after you acquire the property, how much, how much money that property is going to generate. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's not much different from the last 12 months and next 12 months. But if there's a big difference between last 12 months and next 12 months, you definitely don't want to pay for work you're going to do, right? So that's why, you know, a lot of people will advise you to use the actuals to calculate the value. But in the traditional sense, we always use year one NOI, which is after acquisition for calculating the value. And that's what you're going to use when you go to sell it, right? So what goes around will come around, right? So if when you go to sell the property, if you want the buyer to look at their first year, then understand that, right? You know, you can't have it, you know, you can't have it both ways, right? So you have to be consistent in that approach. All right, so the next one is net cash flow. So what is net cash flow? So again, net cash flow is, you know, you have your initial investment. Initial investment is very easy to calculate. So you have your purchase price plus your acquisition cost, whatever that is, plus your loan cost, which is cost of, you know, cost of financing and minus your mortgage. That is how you calculate initial investment, right? So once you have your initial investment, uh, then you can calculate. Uh, so we have your net cash flow here in the framework. So now you're talking about, here we are talking about everything up to this level. Now we're going to talk about net cash flow here, right? So you're going to take net cash flow, divide that by initial investment. That's how you get cash on cash return. So again, that is just a year one metric, or you're going to say my cash on cash return for year one is, you know, 10%, my cash on cash return for year two is, you know, 11% or whatever, right? So that's a yearly metric, that's my point. All right, so then uh, we also want to look at uh, what is a true return on investment on the property. So basically what you're going to do is, so if you look at here, we are to get to net, oper net cash flow, we are actually minusing annual debt service or mortgage payment, but the mortgage payment has two components, right? One is the principal pay down and one is interest. Now the principal pay down is actually a return for you, right? Because your mortgage is being paid down. So to calculate the true return, you also want to look at what we are calling it the ROI, you know, uh, which is basically you take your net cash flow, add back the principal portion that you removed before. So that way you can get a true return. That's not going to be real cash that's coming out of the property, but that is equity being built up or your loan, loan is being paid, paid down, right? So that is actually a return for you as well. So, you know, so that'll, you know, that's a number for you to look at as well. But, but a lot of people just look at cash on cash return, but if you want to take a little bit further, then you can do an ROI as well. All right, so let's move on. So again, all of these metrics are calculated based on this framework, right? That's why this framework is so important. All right, so let's look at uh, the next metric, which is, you know, which is the most important metric along with equity, multiple and few other things. So when we're talking about IRR, yield, or commonly called as yield, same thing, when somebody say yield, it's the same as internal rate of return or IRR. So in IRR, we are going to look at initial investment, which I told you how to calculate initial investment, which is purchase price plus acquisition cost plus loan cost minus mortgage. And you can also, you're also looking for cash flow from operations. So now before we calculate yield, you have to also determine what's your whole period going to be. Are you going to hold the property for three years or five years or seven years or 10 years or whatever that whole period is, right? So your IRR is calculated based on the entire life cycle of the deal. So this is the one metric that's going to give you a true 
yield on the property because you can have a very low cap rate or you pay a very high price for the property. But if there's a value add property, if you can, you know, if you can justify, you know, that you can get your target yield, then it may be worth paying a little extra for the property upfront, right? Uh, so just be careful if you are doing that. But uh, IRR includes all three of these initial investment, how much money went out, how much money is going out, typically in a negative number uh, when you bought the property, how much money is coming out each year from the property, and then how much sales proceeds are you going to get? Like when you sell the property, you know, after you pay off the mortgage and after you pay the sales commissions and everything, how much is left over? So you add all three of these together or, or not add all three, all of these are factored in, in calculating, you know, you know, or calculating yield. And net present value is another way to look at it. You know, so I think we'll probably save that for another time. Uh, it's basically net present value of future cash flow. So you're basically discounting, using a target yield or a discount rate, you're going to be discount uh, all the future cash flows to the present value. Uh, so you can compare different, different investment opportunities, right? So NPV is usually for comparing, you know, different opportunities to see which one might be better when you, when you look at, when you discount all future cash flows. And, and then the banks care about debt service coverage ratio, right? So debt service coverage ratio is the one metric that the banks care about most because that's how much they know how much money the property is going to generate to pay them, right? Pay their loans. So the calculation there is NOI, net operating income divided by your mortgage payment or annual debt service, same as mortgage payment. So, uh, so that's how you calculate debt service coverage ratio. So typically banks will want to see 1.2, 1.3, depending on the asset class and different, depending on the bank. You know, the, that's kind of the, what they're looking for, right? So at least 1.2 times uh, the mortgage you know, amount is coming, being generated as NOI from the property is kind of what they're looking for. All right, so any questions on so far on the metrics? Uh, a couple of things I didn't talk about is equity multiple and there are a few other metrics as well, but you know, most of the time people are going to look at cash on cash return and yield, right? So that's why, you know, so this is kind of a beginner presentation. So that's why I didn't include the other ones. All right, uh, let's talk about how to increase the value of the property. So again, going back to our framework, so this all comes back to the framework, right? If you know the framework, then, every, then you're good, right? You, you can go and write a billion dollar deal, right? So, uh, you know, how do you reduce your losses? You know, better leasing strategy, better marketing, you know, better collections, you know, even better tenant screening. So you're putting good people in there to begin with, so they can, they, they'll pay you, right? So there are a lot of things that goes into reducing losses. So you have to look at all different losses, losses at the property and see how can you make it better, right? So how do you, reduce the turnover vacancy, right? You can do some tenant retention, tenant retention strategies to help with that. Give, you know, treat them well, right? Treating your tenants is, treating your tenants is, you know, well is very important, right? If you keep them happy, then they will stay there longer, right? That is the theory, right? So, and taking care of them and making sure you provide them with good service and good amenities and they'll stay longer, right? And then, uh, so look at every aspect of the loss you have at the property and see how you can reduce it. Now, other income, look at ways to add other income, whether it's adding, you know, laundry facilities or leasing out lawn, you know, washer dryer units or providing covered parking. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you look at everything out there to see what you can do uh, to, uh, you know, to increase the other income. Then expense recovery, look at if there's an opportunity to, you know, build back some of those utilities, right? It's not always possible. You have to look at, what other properties in the nearby market in the near in the market is doing right if other properties are doing it and if you think the market will bear it then you can plan on doing that right plus again you can't change somebody's lease right you can only do that when the leases are turning over so it might take two or three years before you can implement a full drops program and then operating expense so this is a big one right so this is like where you know you might have like 50 lines of operating expenses you have to look at every single line to see what you can do obviously taxes you're going to protest the taxes every year to keep the taxes low. You're going to shop around for insurance to keep that uh, in check. Uh, you're going to implement, you know, water conservation, you know, you know, you know, better faucets, you know, better, you know, whatever you can do to save water, better, you know, better toilets, you know, things like that, because that's a huge expense. Uh, you're going to look at LED lighting to reduce the electricity cost. Uh, you're going to look, you know, to renegotiate your management salaries and contracts to see you know, what you can save there. I mean, obviously, like I said, you know, you don't want to sacrifice service because that will increase your losses, right? So you have to always, there's always a balancing act to provide good service for your tenants that those are your customers 
and also uh, you know keeping the expenses in check. Uh, you can renegotiate all the contracts. Look at all the pest control, landscaping, you know, security services, you know, everything that you can to see if you can renegotiate those contracts to save money, right? So that's kind of what you do. Uh, and also, you know, better leasing and management. So there's a lot of, so you have to look at every single line and see what is opportunity. But obviously the big one is making sure you're protesting your taxes every year so that you keep that in a check. Okay, all right, so back to NOI. So everything that you do there is going to affect your NOI and hopefully in the positive way, right? So we only talk about NOI increasing, right? But the flip side of this is, you know, this is, you know, fair warning to all, everybody who wants to syndicate deals. People lose a lot of money because NOI went down, right? Usually poor, poor management, overflowing for properties and not, not underwriting the property the correct way. You can have the opposite effect and lose a lot of money in this process also, right? So everybody wants to talk about how increasing NOI will create a lot of value and make all of us rich. But I have a lot of stories I can tell you about how, you know, people lost a lot of money in the process also, right? There's always that other side that nobody talks about. So just, you know, I'm not trying to scare you guys or discourage you guys, but you know, as being in business, you have to look at both sides, right? So you understand that. All right, so let's look at uh, an example here of how value creation works. So this is a 20 unit apartment. So let's say we have bought a 20 unit apartment, small one, and we are able to increase the rent by $200 a unit over the next five year period, right? So that is not too bad, right? It's not like you're changing the rents tomorrow. I'm talking about over five year period you can increase the rent by $200, $200. So the total rent increase for the 20 units is 4,000. And that is a $48,000 NOI, you know, rent increase in a year. Let's assume that's NOI, right? So let's, you know, just to keep it simple. And if you can sell this property at 6% cap rate, that extra $48,000 in NOI will generate uh, an extra $800,000 in value, right? So. So that's why everybody gets attracted to multifamily and commercial investments because you can actually create value. In residential, you know, you can only do limiting, right? Based on uh, what other properties are selling in the area, looking at the in the comms. But in commercial, you know, and as long as it's justifiable, you know, if you can increase the NOI using the framework we discussed, you can increase the value of the property. Now, like I said, you know, it could go other way also, right? So you just have to be careful that you know, you, want, you do the market study properly, you do better management, so you don't fall into that trap. Now, that $800,000 value for a 20 dollar 20 unit property is pretty good, right? If you are an individual person or one or two people farming on a deal. Now, you can also use the same numbers to say, what if this was a 200 unit apartment? I mean, this is a little bit of exaggeration here, but I, the, the, the math is the math, right? So if you can get $200 more on a 200 unit property, that'll create an $8 million additional value. And this is not the total price, this is the additional value you created, right? So this is where this is where everybody is, you know, is excited about, right? So that's why people want to get into this business so you can be part of that, you know, when this happens. All right, so now let's, uh, let's talk about uh, what if scenarios and calculating maximum offers. So for that, I have a case study here. So let's go through this case study quickly. So this is a hundred unit apartment complex. So we have four different kinds of units here, one bedroom, one bath, you know, two bedroom, two bath, and some upgraded units here as well. So 100 units, right now uh, there is 71 occupied. So this is property is, you know, have a good amount of vacancy right now. And, but here's the important number, right? So what is, this is the current rent and here's the market rent. So this one bedroom, one bath unit, current rent is $500 at the property and the market rent is 600. That is a loss to lease. So you, can, you immediately have an opportunity to increase the rents if you can renovate the unit or do whatever, it is, whatever you need to do to create some additional value, right? So that's what we are looking for. So in this case, we know we have a 29% vacancy, but when you also factor in the loss to lease or leasing below market, it's actually a 34% loss at this property, right? So that 34% loss is where value add investors are going to look at it then and, and they'd be like, okay, this is really good. You know, I mean, obviously we had to look into it to see what we can do, right? Because there's really an opportunity there. But what if this number was only, you know, 10% or 5%? It's still a good deal for somebody, right? There are a lot of people who are stabilized investors like, you know, pension funds and, you know, like, you know, REITs and, you know, private equity funds that are looking for stabilized properties. They just want steady cash flow. They don't want to do a lot of heavy lifting. So, that's why when you can improve the value, you can sell it to somebody, right? So there's always a buyer for a stabilized property that they can just enjoy cash flow from day one as well. 
It's like some of those people, you know, I, I know some one of my, one of our investors were talking about he wanted to fully amortize a deal in five years, meaning that he wanted to pay uh, pay off the property in five years, and he had negative cash flow. But they're trying to offset their other. You know, it's a tax scenario, right? They're trying to save tax or some other benefit from you know buying a property. In a lot of foreign investors will buy a property for you know zero returns, right? Because it's better than losing their money in their own country, right? So you're competing with people like that. But none of them usually want to do that extra lifting because they know they'll lose money if they try to attempt, uh, you know, you know, repositioning, you know, a deal like this, right? But this is something that takes a lot of muscle and a lot of, you know, determination to go in there and clean up the place and uh, turn it around. All right, so let's uh, take a look at, uh, so here's some, some, you know, I won't go over this in detail, but basically what it's telling you is, you know, you want to calculate your maximum offer price uh, based on a 15% target deal, and your bank wants a 1.3 debt service ratio. You also want to look at the best case and worst case scenario. And you've done some market research and you know similar properties are at, you know, at 6.5 cap rate is the current in the market. Uh, occupancy is about 90% for similar properties. So you know you can get the property up to a 90% market occupancy. And then, so that, you know, again, that is not the uh, that is that ten percent is not the loss, right? Because you're going to have some 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 loss on top of that ten percent, right? And the the projection is that the rents are going to grow three percent. And let's say we don't have PNLs, you know, you can look at similar property benchmarks and say, you know, these similar properties, C-class properties, two hundred unit uh, in this area is operating for about a forty percent of the gross operating income, right? So you can you kind of use some of these benchmarks for your underwriting as well. So that is just some of the data points you're collected before you go to underwrite. Now, uh, let me talk quickly about sensitive, sensitivity analysis, right? So one way to do sensitivity analysis that a lot of people do is they'll create a likely scenario, they'll create a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. So in example here, the rent growth for a likely scenario might be 2%, expense ratio is 45%, stabilized vacancy is 10%, and disposition cap rate, let's say you're holding it for five years, you're going to project that you can sell this property at seven cap, a best, a worst case scenario might be, you know, you get zero rent growth, your expense ratio is higher, and market is down, so you can only sell it at 7.5 percent, right? So that might be a way that you want to create. So there are so many variables that you can use to create these scenarios, but this is just an just an example to give you an idea about when you're starting out how to think, right? So you might want to create a best case scenario, worst case scenario. You know, sometimes I've seen. Uh, people, three people will be underwriting a property together. There'll be a Joe's, you know, case and, you know, uh, you know, somebody, Adam's case or whatever, right? So every, everybody create their own and they compare and see how each of them underwrote. And so everybody can challenge each other on their assumptions. So there are, there, that's a good idea for you to do that as well, right? So you have multiple people looking at it from different angles. All right, so before we go into that topic, let's do a quick demo. All right, so we will go into ROI Muse. So I have this case kind of set up so that you know I can walk you through it. So this is our analysis tool. And uh, so basically everything is in one page. So this will be, we, we have a one page analysis. There's not multiple pages, everything is right in front of you. you can, the numbers are done real time. So you can see the numbers, how when you change something, it changes the whole calculation. So in this case, uh, I don't know why we have a trillion dollar price in here, but never mind. don't worry about that. So we have, uh, let's start with the rental income worksheet. So which is kind of the data we already collected, right? So I already input my rental income worksheet. I have my potential rental income, which I told you is the most important number. That's how you can identify opportunity, 930. And the current rents are kind of low. And I put some notes here saying that I can, you know, I can spend, I can get $100 more for these units. I can get 150 more for these units if I can spend some money, right? So that is kind of the idea of what we want to do for our business plan. So save and close. And what that's going to do is that's going to take that 930 and put that as the top line of my analysis. So we went, so the way this is working, with the way this is set up is we have acquisition assumptions and financing assumptions. We have disposition, which is when you go to sell the property and how, for how long you're going to hold. And then we have the operating assumptions. We went straight into the operating assumptions, right? Because that's the data we have. Well, by the way, we don't have a price for this property, right? They told you to make an offer, right? We all, we all love that, right? When, when the seller tells you to make me an offer or the, property is listed with no price. So that's a scenario here. So let's say we have $930,000 and then we said, okay, the rents are going to, okay, let's just work on year one first. Now the loss currently is about 34%, right? So we'll just use that number because we know it might be actually higher uh, for 
collections and bad debt and everything, but this is year one. So let's say we can bring it down to 34%. Now, other income, we have no other income at the property. Uh, we have no expense recovery at the property and expenses we just put in 50%, right? Let's just start with 50% as a benchmark. And there are multiple ways you can enter the data. I'm just using a benchmark of gross operating income, percentage of gross operating income. So everything below is calculated for you here. So here's your framework, right? So you can see the same firm framework here. These are the inputs for the framework. That's all you need to do, right? Everything is calculated for you here. Potential rental income minus loss, and you can follow along here, equals effective rental income, plus other income, plus expense recovery gives you the gross operating income, minus operating expenses gives you the net operating income, right? So that's how much we care. So we only care about this much, uh, 306 year one, net operating income. So if I wanted to calculate based on a cap rate, if I wanted to say I want to pay, uh, let's say I want to buy this property for 6% cap rate, how much should I pay for this property? Very easy, right? So I mean, right now the price is a, a, a billion dollar or whatever that number, trillion dollar, whatever, right? So just, so I was just playing around with it. So I can just click on the reca recalculate here. And I tell you based on a 6% cap rate on this property, I should be paying for, uh, you know, $511,000. That's the market value of this property just based on a direct capitalization approach of year one NOI. So only thing we have done so far is we calculated the NOI based on, you know, our first year projections. And then we said, okay, now I'm going to apply a market cap rate to get a value, right? So that's what we've done so far. Now let's start building out our remaining of our, uh, our uh, you know, our business plan. So let's say we know year two, uh, and year three, the rents are going to go up about 3%. So we put in 3% there, you can see the calculations are automatically done. Um, then uh, the loss is, let's say we can reduce this to 25% in year two, maybe to 20% in year three, and uh, maybe to 15%. And then we'll leave it at 15%, right? Because there is always going to be, the loss is going to be always going to be a little bit higher than the market vacancy, right? If the market vacancy is 10%, let's say 15% is our loss. So this is just a simple, you know, way to do it. So, uh, so by by five years, you know, we are improving. We are slowly increasing the value of the property. Now, for other income, I put in ten thousand dollars in year two, right? There's no other income. So let's say we put in some covered parking in year one and year two, we can start charging for it. And so we have about ten fifteen thousand dollars a year for that. And we don't, we don't have anything for rubs. Let's say we can do some rubs, you know, starting year two also, so five thousand dollar for some utility bill back and we'll just leave it at 5,000. Okay, you can always model it any way you want it. Now expenses, maybe we can reduce these expenses to maybe 45%, right, by year two, and then we'll leave it at that. So now we have done with our five-year cash flow analysis, right? So every, we have actually built a business forecast for five years, right? So all these numbers are calculated for you and it also calculates your cap rate each year and calculates the cash on cash return your ROI. So this cash on cash return is only 2.5% in year one, right? Because not a lot of money coming out, but your cash on cash return increases next year. And then your ROI is 8%, 14% and so forth. Now let's look at the yield. The property currently, the yield is 31.57%. So the yield is calculated based on, we're going to hold this for five years. We're going to sell it for, let's say we're going to sell it for seven cap. So that's a 28% yield, right? So 28% IRR. And we said we're going to, going to cost you about 5% for sales cost. Now the disposition sales price is calculated using, so if you notice it, so we always, even though you put in five years, we always calculate an extra year, year six, right? Because we need this NOI, which is $515,000. That is the year one for the new buyer, right? So we're going to create our sales price based on year one of the new buyer, for the new buyer. So that 515,000 NOI is what we're going to use to apply this 7% cap rate to calculate the value here at $7, $7 million. So, so basically, uh, now let's look at this now. So we have your loan payoff. This is your loan balance at the end of five years. And here's your sales cost, which is 5%. And then your sales proceeds is $3.5 million. Now let's look at our initial investment. Our initial in investment is 1.2, right? So this one is inclusive of that. So net would be, let's take 3.5 minus 1.2 would be about 2.3, right? So $2.3 million is the extra sales proceeds you're going to create, right? When you sell the property, not bad, right? If you can get as a syndicator, if you can get 20, 30% of that, it's not bad, right? For everybody. 
So this is how a value add investment analysis works. Now let's look at the yield on this property. So now we're going to talk about the target yield, right? So what is your objective going into doing this investment? How much money do you want to make, right? So let's say, you know, your goal is to return 15% yield to your investors, which means typically 15% yield will mean roughly you're going to double your money in about five years, right? So if you somebody invests $100,000 with you, they're getting $200,000 back in five years, right? So if that's the goal, 15% yield, is it's kind of what that is, right? That comes out to. Now, obviously you're going to be taking some profit, right? So let's say we want to solve for 20% yield on the property, right? So because then you have, you know, you, have, you can take your car out as, as well. So now you can see that 20% yield, we are actually getting 28%. So we have, and this is pass, meaning that we are meeting that criteria, right? But if there's enough competition for the property, what is the maximum value you should pay for it? If your target yield is 20%, then you can calculate the maximum price based on that target yield, right? So right now it's $5.1 million. You click on recalculate here, and it says you can pay $5.8 million and get your 20% target yield. That's assuming that everything else is correct here, right? So this is a basic analysis. Then we didn't talk about CapEx, right? You're always going to need some CapEx. So let's say we go back and here say this is, we can get a 75% loan to value loan here. So you know, we didn't talk about the financing here. Let's say we can get about 5% or these days you can get, uh, let's assume this is a uh, five-year Fannie Mae loan that you can get for 3.75%. I think that's kind of, kind of what's going on right now. And amortization is 25 years, but we have a five-year interest only loan. Uh, in the tool, we don't have the interest only feature yet, but we are adding that pretty soon. So actually, and I'll show you what that looks like in the test system. We, we already developed, we're just testing it now. So in this case, I'm going to do a workaround and I'm going to say it's $500 amortization. So if I say $500 amortization, basically I can go down here and see my principal reduction is all zero, right? Because it's interest only anyway. So it just kind of gives me the same effect for the five years. So that's another way you, you look at what financing is possible and underwrite it that way as well, right? So that's one thing that we did not add the financing. And that's, let's talk about CapEx. So for each of these input lines, or at least for most of them, we have a worksheet here. I showed you the rental income worksheet. You have the other income worksheet where you can add laundry, vending machine, things like that. You can track all of your expenses, you know, taxes, insurance, all of that. I'm not using this now because I'm only using, uh, I'm only using a, a benchmark here but let's look at my CapEx. So I have upgrade one unit to, you know, let's say $25,000 or let's say maybe this is $200,000. And so that's about $275,000, just showing you an example of what my CapEx is. So there are two ways you can add CapEx, right? One is you can come here and add year one that you're going to spend $200,000, but most of the time what's going to happen is you're going to add that $200,000 back to the, um, let me put this back on, I think I made a mistake here. So let me put that 20% back and get my price back here. So, uh, and this was based on 75% loan to value. Let me save that. All right, so if I want to, if I'm, I'm typically I'm not going to add that big of an amount here because that's going to put you in a big negative cash flow, right? Because that's going to, even though it doesn't affect the value or the NOI, it's going to affect the cash flow. But typically what will happen is I'm going to get a loan or rehab included in my loan. So instead of 4.1, let's say it's 4.3, right? I'm adding that much more. In, so it's basically instead of 75% loan to value, it's a 78% loan to value because I'm kind of including that rehab I need, that $300,000 rehab I need into that loan. So now, now that we've done all of this, you can look at your, your loan. You know, when we went into solely for five years, now we're getting a 20% yield you know, and that is a $5.5 million property, right? We, that's how you calculate the maximum offer based, based on your target yield. Uh, if you want an extra cushion, you can always maybe go for 25%. I mean, the, the goal here is not to take yourself out of competition, right? You have to be competitive based on, based on your target yield and what the market will allow. But at the same time, if you overpay for the property, you, know, you have a bunch of unhappy people who will never want to do another deal with you, right? So. So this is the job of the syndicator to figure out, find the right balance where you can get a property on the contract at the same time, uh, have a reasonable uh, return uh, for your investors. 
All right, so that is kind of what I wanted to show. Then, you know, as you can see here, I have multiple scenarios here. It's basically very easy. All you do is click on, um, click on the save as. It'll create another scenario for you. Change some numbers, like the sensitivity analysis table I showed you. Uh, you change some numbers, you create multiple scenarios. You can share your deal. You can run reports. You can clone deals if you want to create templates. And uh, you can, you know, you can run nice looking reports that you can send out to your customers. Uh, actually, I'll show you an example real quick of one that's already printed out. Uh, if I can find one. Okay, let's look at this one here. All right, so this is what a report will look like. So as, an, as a syndicator, you can always do your underwriting, run a report and send it to your investor clients or send it to your partners or lender, whoever you want to send it. So this is what it looks like. You know, it says prepared by you on the top, your company logo, whatever you want to put up there. Here's a summary of the deal. You can put in property overview, property highlights. You can put in all the pictures of the deal. These are some interior pictures some exterior pictures, you can put in the site map, floor plan, demographics, all of that stuff. Here's your analysis, here's your underwriting, right? And then uh, here's your rent roll, here's your other income worksheet, your expense worksheets, all of that. And this is actually a 10, 11 page report. And the last page should be your scenario modeling where I have my likely scenario and my, you know, my best case scenario and my worst case scenario, right? So I've done three different scenarios. You can create as many as you want. Uh, hopefully this will help your investors gain more trust in you that you know how to underwrite properties. Not only you threw some numbers out there, but you are actually given in some thought about what might be the best case scenario. What is your upside potential and what is your downside risk, right? In, even in a, so if you can put something like this together and say, you know, my, you know, I think we're going to get about a 19% yield. Best case scenario, if everything works out really well, I'm, we're going to get a 50% return and we can sell in three years instead of five years. Worst case scenario is we may have to hold it for six years. Uh, you're still going to get about 10 or 12% return. So that will increase the confidence of your investors to want to invest with you, right? So that's another reason why you want to do something like that. So that is, uh, that, that, there are a lot of other things to cover, but this is kind of, hopefully this gives you an, you know, uh, an overview of what, what this is all about. And quickly, I want to show you what that test system looks like. So we are working on, adding interest only, uh, we are adding a advanced loan option. So where you can add first loan, second loan, you can also do like interest only, you know, any number of months, right? So 10, 12 months interest only, 18 months interest only, even five year interest only, and a uh, lot more features in there, right? I mean, loan assumptions and things like that. So we are adding some big capabilities there. Uh, next thing for us on multifamily would be to add a feature where you can load your PNL and then how you can create your year one pro forma from your last PNL, right? By modifying, you know, so you can do a side by side, you know, how, what do you want to forecast for year one based on, you know, actuals. So those are some of the features we'll be adding for the multifamily stuff. At the same time, we are adding, you know, other tools for, uh, if we go back to the apps. So we have commercial deal analysis. That's what we use today. So that can be used for office, retail, industrial, uh, any, you know, or even ground up development. So I just did a class today where I showed how to, underwrite, how to underwrite a ground of development uh, for an office project. Uh, we have commercial lease analysis, which is mostly for investors and I mean, mostly for brokers and investors who invest into, you know, office retail properties. For multifamily, you guys, this doesn't really matter. And then we have residential. So if you also in, invest in residential, you can do fix and flip. Uh, you can do, uh, I'll quick, pull it up quickly. So you can, uh, Oh, this is our test system, by the way. So we, we have six strategies here. You can do BRRR using hard money, all cash, rental property using financing and all cash and also fix and flip. So those are the six you know, scenarios you can uh, underwrite using our residential calculator. And then we also have the rehab construction estimator, where if you know, you know how much things cost, you can quickly put together a rehab estimate for a residential property or a construction estimate for, uh, for you know, like if you want to kind of create a, you know, a rehab budget for your multifamily property. You know, you can do that as well in that tool. And then we have some free calculators. If you want to sign up for a trial or a free account, you get access to some of the typical standard calculators, NPV, IRR, understanding some of the financials and cap rate, NOI, compound interest, time value of money, you know, net worth, you know, I mean, obviously our goal is to track our network, right? So I encourage everybody to create your 
your balance sheet or your net worth and then update it every six months to see how you're growing or how, how you're growing your network, right? I mean, that is the game, right? So unless you track it, you don't know what if you're doing it. I mean, at least update it once a year, right? On your network. So that is the whole idea to grow your wealth. So we have that as well. So people to track along, I mean, you know, so, and then we'll be adding a lot more tools and a lot more features as we go along here. All right, so I will go back to the presentation and finish it up. So how are you doing on time? Uh, do we have another 10 minutes to wrap this up or you need to stop here? Yeah, Joseph, go ahead, man. We got another 10 minutes. Okay, cool. All right, so let me show you. Uh, I, I just put that in here last minute here uh, because I know a lot of people who are starting out have questions about how this whole profit splits work, right? So I'm just going to show you an invest, an example. So this is one I'm going to show is called a preferred return and promote model. There are so many different models out there. Some people just do a promote model without a preferred return, you know, but I think a lot of people are starting to do a preferred return. So in this case, what we are talking about is the 90% 90, 90 of the equity is going to come from investors. So if you're raising, you know, a million dollars, 90, 90, 000, you know, 900,000 comes from the investors and maybe you as the sponsor put in 10%. That is just a proposal, right? You don't have to, right? You can put 5% or whatever. But most of the time you want some skin in the game or your investors will want you to have some skin in the game. And we're going to say, okay, preferred return is 7%, then anything excess on top of that is 50-50 split. And when you sell the property, 70% of the proceeds uh, goes to investors and 30% goes to you, right? So that's kind of the model we are proposing here. Okay, so how does this work, right? So let's, let's show you how this works. So here, we need, this is what we need, $1.1 million initial capital, right? That's year, year zero, that's money going out. This is money coming in each year from the cash flow of operations. And then you also have these sales proceeds when you sell the property, right? So this is kind of the numbers we just looked at. So that's the same deal. I don't know, it might be slightly different. And the net sales proceeds is 2.2, .2, which is after you pay back that amount, this is how much you're left with that you can split between you and the investor 70, 30 or whatever you agree on. So that is kind of the setup. And then we are looking at the preferred return, right? So the preferred return is 7%. So you put in 10% money, so you also get, so we are promoters and then investors, right? So we get, we both get the 7% preferred return because if you, if you put money in there, that is a preferred return for that money, right? So you can see you put in $100,000 as the promoter, you're going to get some money here, but you, you know, they're also going to get 7%. But you can see year one and year two, there's not enough to pay them, right? So we are, they're capped at the 73 in the year three, four, and five. Now let's look at what happens to the excess money. Now you can see in year one and year two, there is no, uh, you know, I mean, there's no excess, right? So nobody gets anything. Uh, in year three, four, and five, we have excess money from cash flows. So that is split 50 50, right? So what are remaining? So this is one more, you can be 70 30, zero, nothing, whatever, right? So, and then, when you sell the property, you have your sales proceeds. That is the $2.6 million here. The 2.6 is the total sales proceeds, but uh, the investor gets the 2.6 back. That includes their initial investment of $1 million. You get $800,000 back. That includes your return of your 117 as well, right? So this is how the split works. So you have splits for preferred returns, you have split for excess cash flow, and you have split for uh, sales proceeds. And when you look at the total, Here's your yield, right? You put in 10% of the, of the property, you're going to get a 50% yield, right? They put in 90% of the equity, they're getting a 25% yield you know, on the property, right? But you can see the promoter gets a much higher return for their money. Plus on top of that, you'll be charging acquisition fee and asset management fee and disposition fee and refinance fee and a bunch of other things that you can charge as well as the, as the sponsor and the manager. So that is a split model. And uh, just a little bit about our company, you know, uh, you saw the tools, so I don't know how to speak much about it. So we provide tools and education. That's our goal is to help you guys with your wealth goals and grow your wealth and, you know, income. Uh, our tools are easy to use and affordable. I just showed you how to do it. And then uh, our training is all transformative training. So we do case studies like I just, just did. So by doing the case studies yourself is how you learn it, right? No other tool is going to provide you that, you know, where, you know, we'll give you a case study and a tool and you go on, write it and you practice. And then you, you, you know, you get better at how to evaluate properties. So that is how we do our trainings as well. And we already looked at some of the tools we have, uh, commercial deal analysis, financial calculators and all of that stuff. So here's an example, which I just showed you. So this is one example 
where we have likely scenario, best case and worst case. This is another underwriting where we have four different properties we are looking at. So this is actually a multifamily, the same one we looked at. This is actually a, you know, a development project. This is another townhome project and this is another apartment complex. We are looking four different properties side by side to see which is the better investment, right? I mean, those of you in the corporate world, that's what you do, right? You know, anytime you have a project, you're comparing four different projects to see which one is better return on your money, right? This is no different. And this is a, you know, BRR, single family, or, you know, this is actually a small multifamily analysis, a million dollar property. And uh, just some feedback from some of your users. And um, I know some of you will have questions about how much it's cost, right? So uh, our regular price is 360 per year. So that's about 30, $30 a month. Uh, right now, our promotion is 147 for the year. So you get it for about $12 a month, right? A little bit over $12 a month, very affordable, like I said before. So if you guys want to you know, try it, start a trial. If you want to sign up, you can get it for that 147, right? And then uh, just make a note of that code, or you can always email support at ROIMuse.com and ask for the promo code. So they'll always give you what's the latest promotion. But right now, our promotion promo code is total 147, right? So if you want to get... That includes everything, and that's a yearly price. You get commercial, residential, uh, all the training, all the support, and all the tools we have for $147 you know, for the year. So all you need to do is, uh, if you want to write that code down, you, know, you can use that. You can go to ROI Muse, select our highest package, which is yearly total access package, and use that code. Or you can just email support at ROIMuse.com, and they'll send you a direct payment link, and then they'll set up the account and contact you as well. And then uh, I have a free gift for you. You don't have to buy anything. Um, it's, uh, I'm working on a multifamily due diligence checklist. It's almost done. I have a commercial due diligence checklist. I just need to remove some of the commercial specific uh, lines from there. But if you want the whole thing, you can have it tomorrow. Or if you want to wait, wait another couple of days for me to clean it up for multifamily only, then I'll send it to you in, you know, in a couple of days. So all you need to do is just email me, um, support, again, support at ROIMuse.com or joe at ROIMuse.com. That's my direct email. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to send that to you. All right, that's all, guys. Thank you for allowing me to do the presentation. And uh, we can open it up for, for some questions if you like. Joseph, man, thank you so much, man. Great, great presentation. And I want to say I, on the deal analyzer particularly, I really love the way that you can recalculate uh, your purchase price based on your criteria, your, your, uh, return criteria. That's really cool. I don't think I've ever seen that in analyzer. That's, I like that. Yeah, feature. I think, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really nice feature to have, right? I think one of the things that, you know, everybody struggle with is what is a good deal? You know, what is the maximum I should offer, right? I mean, you don't know how much to offer unless you know what your target yield is. Like a lot of the syndicators, they know that their investors are looking for a 15% yield. So they can kind of back into a price based on, if they can justify, you know, a 20% yield, right? So there's enough for everybody. Absolutely. Well, all right. So we got a couple questions for you here, Joseph. Let's see here. Uh, we got one in particular, uh, Nick wanted to know, have you changed your underwriting due to COVID-19? Are you factoring any smaller rent increases, delayed renovations, increased yeah. vacancies and such? Yes, all of the above. And I talked to a lot of syndicators. I just talked to somebody who was looking at a 270 unit uh, or 290 unit, I should say. Uh, out in, uh, uh, but yes, everybody's adjusting their underwriting. So I think some people are doing, uh, a lot of people are recommending that you don't spend all the money up front uh, because you want to hold on to cash as much as possible. So they are delaying the rehab for maybe another year just to know what the market ends up. So that's one, uh, one thing to do if the banks will allow you to hold on to that money for longer. Uh, obviously, people are underwriting with, you know, uh, 15, 20% vacancies in next, for the next year, right? Mm -hmm. So because, you know, if things uh, after the elections and, you know, you don't know what unemployment, what, how things are going to fall, up, fall out. And if there's more unemployment, I think vacancy is not going to be a problem, right? Because a lot of people are still, there's still demand, especially in good markets, but if people are not able to pay because you know because you know uh, they don't have any job they don't have a job then you're going to have some losses right so you have to factor that in and mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah definitely underwrite for covid um, i had a question related to uh, your reversion cap rate you know what changes if any are you have you anticipated for for your reversion cap well i think what is going on is nobody understands right now right i mean everybody thought the market was going to all fall apart you know and that hasn't happened right especially multifamily is going very strong 
I mean, if you look at market cycles, so, you know, there is uh, somebody, uh, I forgot the name of the guy who is a professor out in Denver, who puts out these market cycles that they track every property asset class by uh, four different quadrants, right? They look at, you know, if the market is going up or if it's coming down or, you know, there are four stages they'd look at. And multifamily in most cases was actually turning the corner to start to come down before COVID happened, right? So a lot of people are warning about a multifamily has been going up for a long time. Now you have to be careful not to overpay for properties and get caught right in that mm -hmm. downward cycle. Because every market cycle that goes up for the last 10, 12 years is going to come down eventually, right? Something is going to happen. So that has always been the case historically, right? So you don't want to get caught in that. But what we are seeing in the market right now is multifamily is still holding very strong, actually getting better because we believe that's because a lot of people are moving money from office retail industrial, <laughs> I mean, not industrial, office retail and other projects into multifamily because office retail is really down, right? You know, there's a lot of vacancy and there's a lot of uncertainty with businesses uh, there. So I think that is kind of propping up multifamily. I think the multifamily is benefiting from that. The other asset classes that is doing very well is uh, obviously residential is crazy, you know, maybe due to, uh, due to uh, interest rates or whatever, you know, the residential market has been more hard than anybody can ever imagine right now. And industrial is doing very strong. So if anybody is looking at any other asset classes, yeah, I would say multi stick with multifamily and industrial. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We've got another question here. Any recommended reading for financial modeling? Oh boy. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I think <laughs> a lot of the time for financial modeling, I don't know if I can recommend any classes. I think you just have to, you know, this comes from the experience, right? Underwrite as many deals as possible. Get every offering memorandum, every PNL you can get your hands on, underwrite it, you know, look at people who are actually operators, and, and get their guidance, right? So having somebody who's experienced to look over it uh, is the key, right? I don't know, I haven't come across any book that will actually teach you underwriting. It's like something you learn by doing. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I had a question related to the uh, net present oh, Actually, value. let me take that back. Oh, I, yeah, if yeah, I can ahead. suggest something, if somebody wants to actually do a class, look at CCIM, right? CCIM 101 teaches you underwriting, right? So that is a very good course cost about $1,500, five day course. So if you want to really get into underwriting, I would look at CCIM 101. Even if you don't want to pursue the designation, uh, you can go to CCIM.com. And I think that's probably the only thing I can recommend as far as an underwriting course. Perfect, perfect, good deal. Um, I had a question related to the net present value. Uh, and, and that's a term or value that we don't really hear a whole lot in the space, right? We talk a lot about you know, cash on cash, IRR. Um, when do you see that value being relevant when we talk about an investment? Uh, it's a target yield, right? So when you, let's say your target yield is you put in 15% as your discount rate, let's say that's your target yield also. So when you analyze your property, the extra amount that shows up in that prop, in that uh, NPV is how much more you can pay for the property and still get that target yield. That's a simple way to look at it, right? So it will allow you to know how much more you can pay. I mean, obviously we have a single click that gives you the price, right? But if you don't have that single click to recalculate the price, you can look at NPV and say, if my target yield or my discount rate is 15%, and that is that's essentially the target yield in this case. You, you're looking at if the NPV is $300,000 or $1 million, you can pay $1 million more and still get that 15%, right? So that is exactly how that relationship works between IRR, uh, target, you know, NPV, and uh, you know, NPV is essentially for target yield purpose. But you don't need that in ROI Muse because we have a single click to calculated for you, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about that. So yeah, yeah. Again, I, I really like that feature. That's a really that's a really mm -hmm. cool feature in that analyzer. So yeah, um, for I, I heard somebody talk about their IT background. So if you're curious, that's called a Newton's bisection algorithm. So that was some some pretty hefty programming that went behind that. Took us a little, quite a quite some time to figure that one out. Yeah, yeah. Well wow. cool. Cool. All right, man. Well guys, any any other questions for Joseph? No, no. All, All right. right. Cool. Well, well, Joseph, we're coming up at kind of near the end of our time here, man. Really appreciate the presentation. Awesome. Awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, I just, I just joined your Facebook group. So somebody accept me so we can, you know, I can share some good stuff coming up stuff as well and perfect, participate perfect. in your discussions. Great, man. Well, we'll make sure to send this video out um, to everybody that's participating and uh, you know, we left to look forward to staying connected with you and, and continue to learn more about our Muse. And so uh, thank you again. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys. Yes, Have a good night. Thanks so Thank much, Joseph. Bye-bye.
All right, guys. So just before everybody tunes out, just so you know, uh, our next virtual meetup will be September 24th at seven o'clock. So we'll be sending out that uh, invite uh, before the end. Uh, well, hopefully by the beginning of next week. So hopefully we'll see you all next next month. So take care. Be safe. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Cody.